All right, so you ready to dive into this stuff about 403Bs? I know, I know. Not exactly the most thrilling topic. <laughs> yeah, not exactly a page turner. But you sent over these excerpts from, uh, what was it called? 403B Myths and Reality. Right, from the Life Insurance Company of the Southwest. Yeah, that's the one. And honestly, some of this stuff about annuities is kind of blowing my mind a little. Yeah, there's definitely some, um, I don't know, common misconceptions floating around out there about 403Bs. Big time. It's like everyone's heard of them, but nobody really knows what they are, you know? So we're going to try and bust some of those myths today, right? Get people the info they need, maybe help them sound smart when they talk to their financial advisor. Always good to be in the know. Exactly. Okay, so myth number one, are you ready for this? Surrender charges. Okay, yeah. They're terrifying, or at least the name is, right? Surrender charge. Sounds like I'm getting penalized for wanting my own money. It's definitely one of those terms that can make people a little hesitant, yeah. A little. It makes me break out in a cold sweat. But okay, so this document, it's saying that, get this, longer surrender periods, those are the ones that seem scary, right? They can actually mean you get higher interest. Yeah, it seems kind of counterintuitive, right? Totally backwards. But the way it works is, well, think of it like this. When they get your money, these insurance companies, they're not just sitting on it. They're investing it in things that are designed for slow and steady growth over time. Yeah. So the longer they have that money, the longer those surrender charges let them keep it invested, the more potential it has to really, you know, build up. Okay, I get that, but what if, like, life happens, you know? What yeah. if I need that money before the surrender charge period's up? Right, that's a good point, and the document actually addresses that. It's not like, you know, just because you have a surrender charge period that your money's totally locked away in some vault. So there are ways to access it. Yeah, for one thing, you can usually take out a loan against whatever you've built up, and usually taking a loan won't trigger that surrender charge. And then, of course, there's, uh, well... You know, if you pass away, right. your beneficiaries would get that death benefit and there wouldn't be any surrender charge taken out. Okay, well, that's good to know at least. But what about if I'm getting closer to retirement? Can I take some of it out then without getting hit with those fees? Yeah, usually even if you got an annuity closer to retirement, so it still has those withdrawal charges, after you retire, you can usually take out up to 10% of what you saved each year without a surrender charge. Oh, okay. That makes a difference. I never thought of it like that. Yeah. It's about finding that balance, right? Mm. Accepting a bit of a restriction in exchange for what could be a much higher return overall. Okay. So maybe surrender charges aren't the big bad wolf we thought they were. Maybe not. But what about those agents? Like, are they really on our side or are they just out to make a buck? Because honestly, I think we've all wondered that at some point, haven't we? It's definitely a concern people have. Yeah. Okay. So myth number two, agents only care about their commissions. Tell me I'm wrong. Well, this document from, uh, you know, the life insurance company, the Southwest, they make the case that it's actually in an agent's best interest to have happy clients. Yeah. You know, clients that stick around and, get this, refer their friends. Okay, but I don't know. Does that really, like, pan out? I mean, how many people are going around recommending their 403B agent to their friends? Right, but think about it. The average person puts, what, like $225 a month? Mm -hmm into a 403B? Yeah, something like that, I think. So even with an 8% commission, which remember those longer surrender periods we talked about? Those are the ones that tend to come with higher commissions. But even then, an 8% commission on $225 a month, that's what, like $216 for the whole year? Yeah. And that's before taxes. So not exactly a life-changing amount. Right. And then on top of that, when those policies renew each year, the renewal commissions are usually even lower. So it's really more about playing the long game, building that trust, getting those referrals down the line. Exactly. Like the document says, pushing someone towards a product that's not right for them just to get a quick commission, that's a pretty terrible long-term strategy for the agent and for the company. Makes sense. i definitely rather have a bunch of happy clients than a bunch of angry ones. <laughs> okay, so maybe we can cut the agent some slack. But speaking of things that make me nervous, let's talk fees. Because no matter what kind of investment you're talking about, there's always a cost somewhere, right? So myth number three, annuities are way more expensive than mutual funds. Is there any truth to that? It's, well, you can't really make a blanket statement like that, you know? Mm -hmm. The document does a good job of explaining this. Actually, both annuities and mutual funds have their own sets of costs. Mm -hmm. It's more about, like, how those costs are structured mm -hmm. and uh, who's responsible for the risk involved. Okay, so break it down for me. Let's start with mutual funds. What kind of costs are we talking about there? So with a mutual fund, you're going to have, first of all, just 
your basic asset management fees, right? Mm -hmm. Those are ongoing. And then you might have transaction fees. Some funds have annual marketing and distribution fees, all sorts of things. And then there's the market risk, which with a mutual fund, that risk is on you, the investor. So if the market crashes, my investment takes a hit, and I'm still paying those fees on top of it. That's the gist, yeah. Yeah. Of course, the opposite is true, too. If it takes off, you benefit. But yeah, those fees are always there. Wait, so where do annuities come? I mean, they have fees, too, right? They do, but it's a different approach. With a fixed or fixed indexed annuity, the insurer, in this case, that's the life insurance company of the Southwest, they factor those costs in when they're calculating their interest rates. Mm. So instead of you paying those fees directly, they're kind of baked into how the product itself works. So instead of me paying, you know, a separate fee, it's just all kind of rolled into one. Yeah, you could put it that way. But the important thing is with those types of annuities, the insurer is the one taking on the market risk, mm -hmm. not you. So basically they're guaranteeing that those premiums you paid and the interest that gets added, they won't lose value just because the market takes a dip. Oh, wow. OK, so it's like with an annuity, maybe I'm giving up the chance to make a killing if the market goes way up but I'm also protected if it all goes south. And with a mutual fund, it's more high risk, high reward. Yeah, that's a good way to look at it. But we do have to keep in mind, this is a document from an insurance company that sells annuities. Right, so they're gonna be focusing on the good stuff. Exactly, there are always two sides to every story. Of like what happens if the company itself has problems? You know, is your money still safe? That's something we should talk about, but maybe in a bit. So it's really all about finding what works for you, right? Your own goals, how much risk you're comfortable with. And speaking of, you know, exploring those options, we've been talking about annuities this whole time, but, and this is important, we're looking at it through, you know, kind of rose-colored glasses maybe, right? Right. This is one company's take on it, and, you know, they're in the business of selling annuities. So. Exactly. It's just one side of the story. Exactly. And you need all the info to really make a good decision, right? Weigh all the arguments, do some more research on your own. Couldn't have said it better myself. So, listeners, I'm going to leave you with this. What questions haven't we asked? What else do you need to know to really feel good about your 403B decisions? Keep digging. And, you know, here's to a happy and financially secure retirement for us all, right? Here, here.